I have a question that links to what you're saying right now. Israel Flores, another fan, asks, uh, how do you feel about being part of two of the most important bands from the prog rock scene? He's referring to Marillion and, of course, Transatlantic. Yeah, well, it's very kind of him to say that. Um, but you are, you are a reference, uh, Pete, and, and I would as, add to that question, how conscious were you at the very beginning of the project that this would be, uh, you know, a project that would impact the prog rock scene as it has? Well, I was hoping... You know, I mean, I was aware at the time that Dream Theater were becoming very big in in, in Europe, um, and at the, at the at the same time, there was a lot of there was a bit of a lull, and pro, pro, you know, progressive rock. It's 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 funny because progressive rock kind of came from England, but there's um, the mainstream press and even the rock press in in England over the years has been very scathing and very insulting about progressive rock. And so, you know, in the, in the kind of, in the 80s and certainly the 90s, uh, well, certainly the 80s and 90s, and even early early 20th century, the name progressive rock was, was a bit of a dirty name, you know, and it was a bit of a joke sort of name. Um, so I was very aware that this, this sort of new metal that... Um, was a stamp that had been put to, you know, bands like Muse and, and I guess, and, and Dream Theatre. Um, and I've, I guess, I guess, you know, the idea of um, being in a band with, with Mike and being more progressive than, 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 than metal could be an interesting thing. It could, it could sway people a little bit. People who would definitely go and be following Mike Portnoy could, could get to see a, a more intricate side of, of, of the music that, that he likes, you know, because really it was, it was my transatlantic was a Mike's, um, it was a kind of Mike wish list of people he'd, he'd, he'd want to do a project with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and he does that. He does plenty of those. I mean, he's, he's done a ton of projects <laughs> all with fantastic people, actually, you know, um, flying colors is a great example of that winery dogs earlier on. There was, um, liquid tension as well. And, um, you know, he's done some great uh, collaborations. And so I was very excited to be asked, um, although it was a daunting prospect because, you know, playing alongside someone like Mike, you kind of, you know, you want to be, you want to be on top of your game to be doing that, really. Mm -hmm. so, well, Talking about great. the music you like, uh, could you say something about the, the, the extra uh, disc that is included in Kaleidoscope with the... The, the, cro the covers you're proposing on this album, it seems like yeah. you're trying to really, it's like a school of prog rock, you really have big big names and big pieces of music, how did you choose those pieces? They were kind of put forward, they were put forward to the board, if you like, with the four of us, um, I, would, I would call the board in this instance, um, yeah, we all, we all nominated a few songs, and... Um, Funnily enough, none of the I I didn't um, I nominated some odd choices I think and none of the songs that I actually would have can would have um, I mean I put I I I, I put um, forward a couple of Todd Rundgren songs because I think Todd Rundgren over the years has written some great songs mm -hmm. and not necessarily back in the early days you know the, I think some of his songs can be kind of updated if you like, and, and, uh, and sonically can be, because um, uh, sonically can sound better uh, with, uh, with, a new, with, a, with a new sense of, um, you know, what you can achieve in the studio these days and, and all of that. Um, so I, would, I was, um, you know, I was wanting to do a Todd Rundgren song, because uh, he, he's a huge influence on loads of people. And um, but I was really pleased with it a focus song. Um, and Elton John, how did that come? About? Elton John. Well, that's interesting as well because two of the two of the people, funnily enough, Focus and Elton John. I wrote a little piece which is in the middle of Kaleidoscope, I think, actually. And it's a little chord thing, and the inspiration behind that was the chords to the start of Sylvia, mm -hmm. and also um, Funeral for a Friend by Elton John. Okay. I kind of had this, 
I wanted to, because it, it was a thing I just sat, I just sat at my piano one day and I was thinking, right, okay, I've got to come up with some music for Transatlantic. Um, and I was tinkering around and I came up with this chord progression and I was thinking, yeah, that would be good if I could get that sense of funeral for a friend in there. But obviously you don't want to rip people off. And I was, so I was trying to combine the kind of the Sylvia chord progression and funeral for a friend feel of how that is a is a fantastic piece of music. I mean, Elton John had, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of prog going on in Elton John's songs, actually, mm -hmm. um, I think. And a bit of jazz as well, there's a bit of kind of Gershwin and stuff in there. There's, a, there's all kinds of stuff in all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, it's nice to, uh, it, well, it's nice to go back and, um, and, you know, when I think of, uh, for example, what was the other one I was going to think of? Oh, yeah, The Nice, for mm -hmm. example. Because The Nice, you know, were quite sort of, um, you know, back in the early days of psychedelic music, you know, The Nice were kind of, The Nice were around there, although they were primarily started out as a pop band. Um, they weren't really a pop band. They were much more of a rock band, actually, When you, especially when you see Marriott. Um, you YouTube some versions of the song, you know, Tin Soldier or any of the songs that they played. Steve Marriott really went for it on stage. He was definitely putting all of himself into a performance, you know, and that was much more of a rock thing that, than, than, a, than a pop thing, you know. You weren't sort of allowed to show any emotion when you've sung pop songs. You had to just stand there in a suit <laughs> and bow at the end, you know, and... Um, and uh, so the nice were definitely getting onto that rock thing, the same as the Who were, I guess. And um, yeah, I think it was a, that was a nice choice as well. What we like, what what we were really trying to do was just just um, you know some some favourite old songs or some songs that definitely mean something to music. Procol Harum is the third. Mike Portnoy tweeted yesterday that it, it's the 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 first time that a prog rock band covers Procol Harum. In three albums, and uh, yeah, I suppose is, it is. is that incidental, or is it Procol Harum an important band for you? Well, funnily enough, they were, they're, they're not an important band for me per se, no. But having said that, they were an important band. I know loads of you know. I used to go to when I was a kid. I would kind of go to. Um, I had a, a sister, my sister was four years older than me, so I would sometimes get manage to get into parties where you know there was older people and. They were kind of listening to stuff that I was probably not really into myself. And Proko Haram, I could, I could, you know, Salty Dog and all of that. There's definitely a, a lot of people a bit older than me definitely thought that Proko Haram were, a, were, were an influential band. And they were, you know, they, they, they definitely were. So, um, so it's good to, yeah, it's good to have a nod back to people that are, that, that did all of that.